and Tropical Nomad, the home of Itchy, Itchy Mania, and everything else going on in this amazing place. Um, what an incredible week it has been, uh, especially if you're in clean tech. Uh, Joe Biden won the presidency, but the old guy is not moving out, the other one. Um, so we're going to see where this thing goes. I've got a lot of really, really encouragingly uh, yeah, messages from you last week about uh, my commentary on the U.S. election. <laughs> Um, not everybody seems to be a Biden fan out there, but please excuse us. We're in clean technology, so obviously for us, a Biden win is a huge, huge step in bringing the U.S. back to the Paris Agreement and everything that will come afterwards. Um, a few things from me up front. we got some events coming up before we're going to talk to Emma, who's joining us. I think you see her in the background here. But uh, give me one second, because we have a lot of uh, really cool things coming up in the next few weeks. Um, first of all, subscribe to this channel on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. Second of all, please come to members.exventure.co to become part of our free membership community here of clean tech professionals and entrepreneurs. And then we have coming up uh, over the next few days, we have a program on Tuesday with Douglas um, from Set Ventures is going to be joining us. And then we have Gerrit DeVau from Shell Ventures joining us for our EX Mastermind series in the next coming weeks. And on November 25th, we're going to do our first EX Venture Night from Bali, but we're going to be presenting Israeli tech companies. It's going to be super awesome in a collaboration with Terra Ventures. And on December 3rd, we're going to have our big EX Venture Night, Bali, USA, and Canada, where we're going to provide you know, information on the best 15, 16 technology companies we're able to find and feature from the US and Canada. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So, so much going on. So please check out members.exventure.co, sign up so you stay on top of all the programs that we are producing almost on a bi daily basis at this point. All right, enough from me. Let's go to Emma. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? You're doing very well. Where are you based, Emma? Tell us something about yourself. I'm based in Cambridge. Excellent. In the, in the UK. All right, Cambridge, UK. Yeah, uh, Cambridge is a hotbed for technology startups. Okay. Uh, we've had autonomy and ARM. Um, it's called the Silicon Fen. So, yeah, it's a very exciting place to be. And uh, there's now quite a lot of uh, clean tech being developed. Okay. Well. Cool. I mean, I spent a few years of myself in, in the UK uh, building clean tech systems and a lot of government funding there. And actually, the UK, um, no matter what people say, really has been a front runner in implementing uh, low carbon technologies. Um, you know, it doesn't get a lot of credit for it as often as they should do. So, Emma, what are you working on right now? Um, well, I'm. Um, I'm currently trying to find um, lots of investors and clean tech companies who would like to attend a clean tech venture week that is being organised by Cambridge Clean Tech. Fantastic. And that needs to be all UK companies or can there be a, a global uh, funnel that we, we send to you? No, that can definitely be a global audience. Um, we've got uh, 28 companies pitching for investment and uh, some of those are from uh, non-UK companies. Oh, fantastic. So everybody is welcome to attend. Uh, when is that going to happen? Uh, from the 23rd of November. Okay, uh, very good. And uh, yeah, give us a little bit of timing, probably a UK time starting nine o'clock or what, what should we prepare for? I think it starts at 10.30. Excellent. Uh, is it still open for more companies or have you, have you closed the registration process on this? Uh, yeah, it's closed for the pitches, mm -hmm. um, but anybody who would like to come along, you know, is very welcome. Investors, clean tech companies, you know, associated organizations. Excellent. Um, if I'm coming in as an, as an investor, um, do you have like a data room available for us? So how, how is the process? Um, how do I find out about the companies, get the background information on them? Um, how does it work? Yeah, there's a website, there's Clean Tech Venture Week, and on there you can see um, the names of the companies and um, the full program. But this, this um, so is currently like no, no data room or something where I can, can get the company pitches or um, that will come after? 
Um, no, but there is the opportunity to meet the companies beforehand as okay. the platform will be opened uh, a week before. And uh, the, com yeah, the companies uh, we're looking at, uh, is, uh, are we looking more seed phase or you know, growth companies? What stage are they in or is it very open when it comes to that? Um, it, it's seed phase, phase really, you know, they're at seed A or seed B. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And what is, what is your role in this? Uh, is this a university associated? Um, is this your company? Uh, who had this idea? I mean, I, I think it's great. Every opportunity we can get to get these companies out there to grow faster, I think is uh, super welcome. Uh, who is running the show? So it's organized by Cambridge Clean Tech, and um, I work for them helping with social media mm -hmm. to promote it. And I also work for other clean tech companies doing integrated marketing activities okay. um, through lots of different channels. So I've, I've been in marketing for over 20 years, um, a lot of it in, in B2B technology marketing. Oh, excellent. So you're a marketing company, a little bit like what we do. We, we mainly do investor marketing, right? Not so much a broader audience. Um, and so you put this event together. Um, what are kind of the investors you're going to have on the show? Um, or not the show, I mean, but who is following you? Uh, do you kind of have underwriters for this? Or can pretty much just any investor sign up to your program? Yeah, any, any investor can join the event. Excellent. I, I think we would definitely, can we be part of this if we sign up? We know lots of oh, investors. Yeah. yeah. I have personally I invested a lot of money and other people's money into clean technologies. Haven't always been successful uh, to be. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really looking for a winner there at some point. My own staff in the back is going like. <laughs> um, no, but we love to be part of it. And, and maybe if, if we can work on this together, we would love to present some of your companies, um, maybe the winners or whatever you choose on one of our programs, if that helps, um, you know, all we do is kind of reach out to our investor networks and uh, if they like it uh, and, and somebody gets an investment in, I think it benefits everybody. That would be interesting to you. Yeah, I think um, if, you, if you come along to the event, you'll be able to see, um, you know, the names of all the companies and, and have a chance to meet with them before the pitches. Yeah. So it's a great, it's a great opportunity to, to meet the companies. Um, you know, they're in, an, in a variety of areas, uh, water resource, for example, um, IoT, um, circular economy, and uh, future mobility. Cool. As well as smart cities as well. So there's a really good uh, broad range. Yeah. So I think you find it really interesting. I, we will definitely be there. I mean, I can promise you that we will be there and we're going to try to talk to as many of them as possible. I said we have a rather international investor network that is looking at this. And um, it sounds super exciting. And I said we don't have as many companies on from the UK right now as we probably should. I, because I used to live there. There are a lot more companies um, than we might notice from outside of the UK. It has kind of a little bit isolated itself there in the market. But uh, I'm sure there's a lot of really, really cool stuff out there. We might actually know a few of these companies. So please, let's work together on this. We're very, very happy to present them, to present you, and uh, give them a broader audience. Uh, we would be very, very happy to, to help with that. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that would be fantastic. You know, just definitely to, to link them up to, uh, to other investors that might be interested. Absolutely. Emma, thank you so much for coming on the program. We're going to put your link into, you know, wherever you're watching this on LinkedIn or YouTube or Facebook, all these different channels. We're going to put your links up. Um, does it cost anything for investors or a viewer to show up to, to your program? Sorry? Uh, is there a cost uh, to attending your event for investors or how does it work? Uh, yeah, all the prices, the, the prices have changed slightly because I think, um, yeah, with, there were some early bird tickets. But all the prices are online and I can, I'll send you the link. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to put that link online. And again, what we're here for is to put the spotlight on these companies to accelerate their growth and their technology. And so, Emma, thank you so much for your effort. Thank you so much for coming on the just program. Just one last and, question. Okay, one last question from the Englishman in the room here, Oliver. Um, just with the whole global climate right now, is the event going to be broadcasted online or is it a physical event? Just to understand that. Oh, okay. I thought Oliver has a mic. Is it a purely online event or is it uh, online, offline? Uh, how do you do this? 
But this particular event, because of COVID, is online. Yeah. And it's a week it's a week long programme of expert talks, networking and pitches. So there'll be some pitches every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but in February this year, um, there was a clean tech venture day that was held in London. So in normal circumstances, you know, it would be a physical event. Um, but this year, you know, it's going to be online and it's a week long programme. So it's going to be really fantastic. Very good. Uh, Emma, we're also going to invite you into our community platform. If you want to put all the information up there and the, the specific events, we've got about 600 uh, clean tech investors right now on our platform. Feel free to add all this info. And we just wish you all the luck with the program. And I can promise you we will be there. Thank you so much, Emma, for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Great yeah. to meet you. We'll see you soon. Bye. Good luck. Bye. So, um, as I said, it has been over interesting week we had the u.s election uh thing so much going on and oliver what are we going to talk next my favorite subject called census or is that coming later do we have to to wait to i don't think we could even wait any longer no We're i know I, i'm so bit. excited <laughs> i'm so excited is, is that what we're doing next how uh, we can do let's please do let, let's let's do it because um s some of you who might know me a little bit better is that there i my heart is not just in clean technology um, I have a few different interests, and, and one of it is actually one of the experiences in my life where I really learned a lot. When I was uh, 19 years old, I moved to New York City from Italy and uh, was faced with a real hardship. And that was that I was a very spoiled red wine drinker at that point. Uh, I had been through the entire Chiantigiana in Italy. I loved the thick Barolos and amazing wine. And then I came to the U.S., and I wasn't 21 yet, so I couldn't get a decent drink. And that was really something that kind of changed my life forever. I got involved in a restaurant called Cafe Tachi. It's still out there 25 years later. And uh, because the place was almost uh, bankrupt when we started, because the artist took so long to build it, we just said, oh, come on, screw this. We're just going to bring in some artists and do what we love to do. Play some music, you know, listen to recordings, bring in some artists, and just have a good time. As the New York Times said, do what crazy Europeans would love Europe to be. Right, this kind of uh, retro feeling about music and, and, and joyfulness that we brought to this place. And um, it taught me a lot about business because there was no business plan behind it. There was no concept behind it. When we told people that we're going to you know, do opera in a restaurant, they thought it was just the dumbest idea ever. But it turned into a massive business success. And people loved it and it really felt that it meant a lot to people, to the community in New York City on the Upper West Side. It became important. It was a place you never wanted to miss one night because you never knew what was going to happen. It was controlled madness on a nightly level. And um, it was so successful, actually we ran the place uh, for almost nine and a half years when I was there. And then I left New York City, the place is still out there on tour, so they're still doing well after 25 years, which is an eternity in New York City. Um, but I actually vowed to pretty much never set foot and run a restaurant again in my life. Even though wherever I went for the last few years, the question is not, Julian, are you saving the world through your technology? It was always, are you going to open a restaurant? Which is a little bit more shallow, but also a little bit more fun in general. And um, so we came up with this idea about seven days ago to open a nightclub in Changu that goes to this closed up COVID places. We have a lot of restaurants that are shut down, tours have disappeared. And thanks to Ichi, who you know very, very well from the show, he has been a frequent guest. Um, he invited us over to, to one of his places and say, listen, it's not being used right now. Do whatever you like. And he provided incredible food. And we just invited some friends and we recreated this community that I really miss from New York City with, I would say, even higher level of energy and uh, definitely a lot of really, really beautiful people. And if I understand it correctly, Oliver, we got a little uh, video, right? Uh, we do us. indeed. Uh, it's not just a little video. It's, it's not just a little video. Felix here did an incredible job um, using the new Sony uh, A7S III camera in low light at 12,000 ISO. I mean, if you're into this, it's freaking amazing the results of this thing. And uh, roll the tape. This is our first night of Census Changu our new lifestyle club, or whatever you want to call it, organized madness, New York style, in beautiful Bali. I hope you enjoy it.
Wow, I'm, I'm still uh, impressed. Uh, we just released this last night, it's about 200 views. I would say about 180 of them come from me. Just keep watching it again and again and again because it was exactly that kind of you know, lifestyle and, and passion that I wanted to see in the place. Um, but you also know that we are all about educating entrepreneurs and I think there is a big lesson in what we have shown with this place. And um, it brings me back to kind of an idea that when I talk to entrepreneurs and we obviously have a lot of companies reaching out to us, they often work for months and years on these apps or these programs or these ideas. And they take a very, very long pathway and what they really forget to do is try to test their market as quickly as possible. And so they work for two years on something, you know, Oliver, can you find out what was the music platform, Quibi or something like that, right? Just shut down again. Um, after like a few months raising hundreds of millions of dollars, so much work goes into something until entrepreneurs try the market if actually anybody wants that product. And I don't get it. And my constant advice, and I think senses of that was, you know, the proof that it works is don't spend too much money. Make your idea happen right now and try the waters if there's an audience for it. So census at the end of the day, you know, cost me a few hundred bucks, right? I, I can live with that. But I didn't go out and build a restaurant, design a restaurant, hire a designer, hire the musician, spend a year of my life to build an environment, then to test it out on an audience. I work with Itchy, you know, that already has a place. I focus on what was important to us, creating an incredible experience, a show, which we don't have here anymore. We don't have theaters, we don't have movie theaters, everything has been shut down for months. And focusing on the content and the people. And now if I want to go forward and maybe want to turn this into a real business, we have a proof of concept. We know that people appreciate our show. So now for the next few weeks, we can try this again and again. We can get better at it. Obviously, a lot of things we can learn. We can understand our audience better. But we know that there's a market for it. So please, all the entrepreneurs out there, don't waste your money and your time. Test your product as cheaply and quickly as possible. And then if you get a feedback like this, if you're there at 6.45 in the evening, and I'm still coming out of the shower and Oliver texts me and says, listen, the place is full. Um, you know there is some interest. You're onto something. And then you can double down, you can triple down, you can quadruple down. But then you also have support from people because you've already shown that you can do it. So if you're not building a super complex technology that needs prototypes and everything else, demonstrate that there's a need for your product as quickly as possible before you waste your time and your money. And I think that's the lesson we have learned uh, from Census last week. Ichi, give us uh, two seconds. Before we talk to Sonia, if you can give us two minutes, um, I want to you know, introduce this uh, friend of mine here, Ichi, and then we're going to be right with you. Um, Ichi, so maybe last week on the program, we came up with this idea. I called it Ichi Mania, then it turned into Census. Yeah. It was super fast, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Julian. Yeah, it was amazingly fast. I mean, such a quick ex execution. Couldn't believe it, but we did it. That's really amazing that it, it actually worked, you know, but I think it was all about the trust and the teamwork, yeah. you know, so that we just, we just knew that the yeah, division, you'll be great fun, you'll be amazing, a lot of people will love it, so we just did it. And uh, yeah, of course, we didn't know anything about whether that's gonna be successful or all that, but we said to each other that- Let's do it. Long as, yeah, we, you know, let's enjoy it. Right? What's the worst that can happen? But now, I mean, you, you often come from the other side, you build expensive restaurants with decor and you train the staff and you get the Nobu chefs in to help you out. Um, yeah. This was a proof of concept that cost nothing. We did that's it right, yeah. for like, no budget. Exactly, I think yeah. Broke even by the end. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the thing is that it was a really great help for us because the thing is that we were operating kitchen still, but you know, it's like a you know, dark kitchen kind of setup. We don't do any more um, restaurant operation from that venue, and that was really great for us to be able to to you know kickstart you know again, um, and also that it was a really great um, opportunity. So thank you very much, Julian, for and giving think people giving will us come a chance. Back, right? Absolutely. I think it was a really great event for us too. Fantastic. Thank you. So our lesson out there. Thank you very much, Ichi. Thank you. To all the entrepreneurs out there, if you have a concept like this, don't spend a lot of money. Don't spend a lot of time. But if you can somehow avoid it, get your proof of concept as quickly and cheaply as possible. And then if it does work, double and quadruple down on it. Maybe one of the most important entrepreneurial lessons. We just launched a lifestyle brand in Bali, which is not that cheap as it sounds. Um, for pretty much no money and we had an incredible time doing it. 
Right? So my lesson for this side. But now we're moving on to H2 Energy and Sonia Davison who's joining us. Can you hear me, Sonia? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very, very well. Where are you based? I'm based in Israel. Oh, in Israel. Fantastic. Uh, Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? There's Shaba in the south. Oh, cool. I was just going to say there are pretty much only two options, but uh, there are some more. <laughs> Fantastic. No, I, I love Israel and, and uh, it's really incredible to see how much technology and how much innovation is coming out of this tiny little country. It's uh, mind boggling, I have to say. Well, we work hard at it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do, did used to, to work and live in Israel for two summers, so I really appreciate it very, very much on, on so many levels. Uh, not that many Germans, new generation, that they get the opportunity to live and, and work in Israel uh, about 15 years ago. It was a very, very life-changing experience for me. But uh, Sonia, tell us about what you do. I'm just taking a wild guess. It has something to do maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, our company's why hmm? is to leave the world better for our children and our grandchildren. So our technology, our first technology to do that is the storage of renewable energy. Renewable energy is not stored. We found a way to inexpensively and quickly to do that. We do it by separating water to its component parts of hydrogen and oxygen. And what makes our company unique or different is we're doing it by electromagnetic waves. You're doing it by what? Electrical impulse? Electromagnetic waves. Okay. Radio waves, microwaves. Um, would make we were more efficient than electrolysis for about 88.2 versus 60 percent. Our capex is half, 50 percent. We have a working proof of principle prototype. Our patents were granted in Europe and the USA in 2019. In 2020, we received additional patents in France, Germany, and Great Britain. We're presently involved in commercializing our technology. Our next step would be to go from grams, which we have, up to 100 kilograms per day. Wow, that is actually quite groundbreaking. Uh, where does this innovation come from? Is, is this your idea or uh, tell us something about the background of your innovation? Um, when I was a child, I spilled water and my mom, instead of getting mad at me, took the time to explain some of the principles of water to me. So I went through elementary school, high school and university. Whenever they mentioned water, I paid attention. Okay. Um, so, microwave electrolysis, if I understand that kind of correctly, right? right. Um, what are the next steps for your company? I mean, obviously, green hydrogen right now is, is a massive subject, right? A lot of money going into it. I ran a green hydrogen company a decade ago. Uh, nobody cared anymore for a while, but the subject is back, and it's bigger than ever. So, what are the next stages for your company? Well, we're, we're trying to raise funds. We're looking for a million on a five million cap evaluation. Um, we, we believe we could get in and out of a lab in six months and then into field testing. Since we have a working prototype, it's not going to take us long to get in the field and test. Um, does it need to be an Israeli lab or would a German lab do for you as well? A German lab would work. Um, so if I would say we can probably do this for 80 to 90 percent cheaper because we have government funding available and do it at Fraunhofer in Germany. Would that be interesting to you? Sure. Right, yes. Because I actually run uh, one of the fuel cell projects for the German government from here. And uh, the fuel cell project is based on synthesis gases, but obviously it is very, very open to other forms of green hydrogen. And the project partners Fraunhofer IKTS in Dresden. And we get lots of government support to do this kind of projects because I don't know if you heard about, it, especially the German government has given just, I think about 15 billion uh, for the next few years in developing a green hydrogen economy. So it's becoming the highest funded market in the world. If that could be interesting to you, I would love to make an introduction to our partners. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I, listened, I, I, I listened to uh, Dr. Werner, who yeah. does a lot of hydrogen things, and he just had a thing about the, the recent um, German hydrogen thing saying it was difficult to navigate it. We yeah, it's, it was it's all new regulation um, and again it has always been kind of the sleeping giant for the last few years. Uh, Germany kept it alive also in the automobile industry and everything else uh, but we work very closely with Fraunhofer. We also work very closely with the German Center of Aeronautics 
um, their mm -hmm. hydrogen branch, and uh, we have a lot of partners that, that do exactly this. So generally, you, you're in that stage where you could bring a prototype to, to a laboratory? Is that correct? Yeah, correct, correct. That's we need amazing. to buy some more parts to scale it up. Yeah. That's all. Um, amazing. So we're more than happy to help with that. Have you looked at government funding outside of Israel? I know that Israel is very good in the startup phase, but you know, when you really want to launch a, uh, you know, an international product, there seem to be some limitations sometimes. Have you looked at other European markets to, to scale your product? We've, we've talked with lots of investors all over the world. Um, we are in the, we're going to present to a government program in two weeks. Uh, so we're at least looking at that. Um, we were looking at some of the government programs out of the United States mm -hmm. um, with the NIST program, which gives you uh, a lot of funding with no equity again. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah. the nice thing about government grants often is it, um, is that we do this, and I, I think it's legal, um, is that we file for very similar grants in multiple countries, and they usually, uh, within the European Union, if it's a European Union funded project, got to be a little careful with that, but is between Europe and the US, for example, if you bring the same technology to market with different government grants, it's usually not illegal to do so, and it can leverage your investor money. Um, do you have a, a pitch deck you can share with us? I'll be sure. very interested in looking at that. Do you want me to do it right now? Um, yeah, please, if you could send us an email, and again, we are very, very happy, pass you on to our friends at Fraunhofer and at DLR, see what kind of grants we can uh, generate for that. Uh, do you have an, okay. already an investor backing you in Israel, or? We have a secondary investor, okay. um, um, Zora Fund out of uh, Tel Aviv, as well in the back us, but we need our first investor. Excellent. All right. Um, super interesting. So please share your deck. If somebody's watching this right now, I know we have a lot of um, okay. you know, clean tech investors with us. Seed phase, always a little bit more difficult. I like to go with angel investors, family and friends and government um, until you're kind of on that growth trajectory. Um, but this very early phase in clean technology is always tough to find investors uh, for it. So it takes a lot of resilience and often, uh, you know, a lot of rejection because the funds really want to come on board when you have the proof of concept. You live it in the market and then they want to ride the hockey stick. Um, but obviously, you're in a very, very hot technology market right now. Everybody's wondering and how we're going to store our energy when the sun is not shining. It's as simple as that. I think solar has won the game. We'll have cheap energy in abundance during the day, but unless we want to switch off all the lights at 6 p.m., we need other solutions to integrate nicely. Well, there's, there's lots of wind energy off of Germany, too. Yeah. Just to get, it, just to get the other portion of the market. I, exactly. I'm not, I'm not, I, I want to store the energy. I don't care where it comes from. <laughs> I, I'm totally technology agnostic. I just want to see it done, and we know that it needs to be economically viable. Otherwise, it's not going to be successful. And I think green hydrogen can be, I'm, I'm also a little bit skeptical, I said, because I ran a green hydrogen company myself. Hydrogen is, is not as easy as it sounds. Um, it's kind of difficult to handle it all the way downstream, but I think we have solutions for all of this. So, um, well, Dr. Dr. Werner had a conference last week, one of the largest uh, hydrogen conferences. Mm -hmm. And there was a total of 77 companies involved in that, um, which he gave us a hyperlinks to them. And they're all, a large percentage of them were from Germany that were, had been in hydrogen for quite a few years, over 20 to 30 years, some of them, yeah. compressing hydrogen storage, of hydrogen, and, and et cetera. Uh, the amazing thing about Germany was, and I've been a government agent for, for the last 12 years running this kind of programs, is that, uh, and I've done this for the German government but on an international level, and Germany was, the, for the last 10 years, 15 years, Whenever you talked about green hydrogen, Germany was the only country that really kind of kept it alive, right? Because they, they were not going to go fully electric on automotive, and there was always, even Hanover Trade Fair, there was always this forgotten little back booths of German government promoting hydrogen, and nobody wanted to hear it for 10 years. And maybe now the time is right. I would really love to see that. Sonia, thank you so much for your time. Thank we're you. happy to share your information. It. And we're going to take this offline and, and take it further. Very happy to help on this. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye to Israel. Bye. Yeah, green hydrogen has been uh, one of these topics. Um, I would say this year, uh, electric vehicles, electric transportation, and green hydrogens are probably the two hottest investment subjects. And uh, that all comes together with 
the evolution of solar energy now being the cheapest energy source that we probably ever created uh, in human history. Uh, we have now deals done for 1.2, 1.3 cents per kilowatt hour. So in many countries like Saudi Arabia, Dubai, if you're in the desert, if you have a lot of sunshine, electricity is becoming free. And that is such a game changer to so many people out there, including myself. We always thought that we're going to have peak oil and energy is going to get more and more expensive. Now, because of renewables, the total opposite has happened. Energy is cheaper to generate ever, but only for this few hours during the day, and it's slightly unpredictable. So it's going to change geographies uh, so much of where the new economic powers might lie in the future, because now suddenly in the desert, you know, you can do anything if you have electricity. You can do water, you can do... I mean, an amazing company last night, Oliver, um, doing um, AI for farming. Correct. Aruga from Aruga, Israel as well. from Israel. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they take out the bees out of the pollination process via AI-controlled robots. So bees, obviously, one of the things they don't really adapt well to, to desert climates. Um, now we have everything to make the desert green and actually, uh, you know, a viable source of... of um, Plantations and everything else. We got electricity. We got water. We got very very efficient systems that don't use a lot of water. Now we even have AI backed pollinating robots. Now, how freaking cool is that? Yeah, it was it was an incredible technology and pitch, and even replacing human resources in in that model is worthwhile. And it was phenomenal to see the the video of the robot working and what it does and how sort of highly intelligent the development is. And, and as you said, it's the combination of everything right now. It's hydrogen, it's solar, it's storage, it's AI. We're in the cusp precipice of something really exciting. And we always said it, it's not one solution, it's the combination of all of them. Um, so it's, yeah, really looking forward to it. And, and a solution that can grow. I mean, we looked at the robots yesterday and the AI behind it, right? They start with pollinating the, 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 the tomatoes, whatever they had there. And, um, but they go, of course, a lot further. They can you know, now decide in the future stage, are the tomatoes ripe or not? You know, do we have any kind of infections? Um, are we going to have reduced yields? So optimizing the forecast. Um, there's so much that can be done. And, and farming, obviously, is a very, very change-resistant industry generally. Very, very conservative. But if you now have pollinating robots in the desert, I mean, that's really kind of awesome. I mean, that's the moments we live for. So Oliver, what are we going to do next? Um, well, it's quite a nice transition on looking at sort of our Tuesday schedule um, and what we do for companies in terms of their pitches. There's um, incredible developments and technologies that are out there that we see. But in order to present them, you have to understand who and what you're talking to. And uh, next week, we have Set Venture coming on. And it'd be quite a good throwback to look at when we first spoke to him uh, with yourself uh, a few months ago and have a rewatch of his interview and, okay. and have, a, have a look at that. Very awesome. Because uh, as we started, as I said, we, we see ourselves as like this intersection between uh, startups and raising funds. Because out of our experience, if you don't have enough money available, um, to, to grow your company, uh, you're simply never going to reach that goal and probably you're gonna, your technology is just kind of not going to go anywhere uh, for a long time, at least not fulfill the potential that it has. So I always felt that lack of capital, lack of funding is holding technology companies back, but also there is a lack of understanding of tech CEOs and engineers of how the finance industry works and how the people on the other side that they, that can help you to make your dreams come true actually operate and how they think and who these people are. And this is how we started EX Venture. I'm just looking at this video. Uh, interesting uh, hair coloring there on myself, so you can see this was a few weeks ago. I was waiting I come for you up to with mention something that one. every month. One week, you know, I change my hair color. One week, I open a nightclub. One week, I go vegan. Um, that's what I try to contribute to our society to make things more exciting. And people do talk about it. It's remarkable how many people talk about my hair color. And that's why I'm bringing it back up again. But this was a really, really good interview uh, with Set Ventures. And it gives you a great introduction of who Set Venture is, how to work with them, how the whole process works. So if you're raising money out there, please watch this. And then next Tuesday, we're going to have uh, Douglas on to work with me on the EX Pitch Mastermind helping entrepreneurs to optimize their message and their communication so investors stop saying no. 
Because if you're not preparing your preparation correctly, you'll get no after no after no, and you're just wasting your time, potential, and money. So let's get it right from the get-go. So um, very, very happy to bring this back. So let's roll the tape. Very well, thank you. Great to be on. Sure. Uh, so I've been at uh, Set Ventures now for uh, eight years, uh, and I have a background in physics and chemistry. So definitely the the most technical person in our uh, in our team. Um, I worked as an energy consultant uh, out of London doing stuff for all sorts of uh, big companies and governments, um, as well as some uh, fun small tech stuff uh, spin out out of uh, the consultancy as well. Um, and since then, at Set Ventures, uh, doing deals. Sure. Uh, well, Set Ventures is a, a obviously a venture capital fund based out of uh, Amsterdam, as you said. Um, we are purely focused on the energy system transition. That's all we do. That's all we've ever done. Um, we're currently investing out of our third fund. So we've been doing this uh, for the for a very long time. Um, until recently, we were definitely the uh, the only uh, venture capital fund purely focused on the energy system transition in Europe. But we've been doing this since 2007. Um, initially with a really hard tech focus, uh, then second fund was more smart energy focus, and the third fund now is really an energy system transition. So those companies that really have an impact on how energy is going to be used in the future, it's enabling that future energy system. That's what we're interested in. <laughs> For us, really what we've done is focus on what's coming four or five years from now. Uh, I mean, that's always the goal of a venture capital fund, right? It's not what's uh, in vogue today, but what uh, is going to be in vogue in five years. Um, and we've just been very successful at doing that. So I say first fund, still tech focused, but we still had some smart energy stuff in there. Um, those are the ones that did well in the first fund, and that allowed us to go out and raise our, uh, our second fund. Uh, with a smart energy focus, two really nice exits uh, in the second fund so far. Uh, and on the back of that, we are, we uh, finished, uh, did a final close last year on our third fund of, uh, of 100 million. So always looking at what the next thing is going to be, not just, you know, where we are today. Um, and also, you know, having the track record, you know, um, myself and the, the other members of the team are really focused on, you know, energy and services and digitization and that is all the, the, the key areas of what's what's needed for the energy transition. Yeah, I'm still on the fence with that hydrogen. I say I've been uh, I've been around for both sets of uh, uh, ups and downs with hydrogen. First in the early 2000s, really as the tech side. Then uh, you know the, the 2010 sort of uh, field as a consultant then as well. So we did a lot of stuff in hydrogen back then. Uh, and you know, now back uh, back in vogue again. I mean, one thing I will say about hydrogen is, you know, there's a lot of money going into that area, so that certainly has the best opportunity um, to succeed. And there are certain areas where there, in effect, is no other choice. So there's definitely areas for green hydrogen in particular. But whether it's going to be, you know, the, the huge market that some people are thinking it's going to be, yeah, we'll 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 see. 
thousands of money was going to be true. And then, like, everybody left us, like, how could I do it? Um, <laughs> that's definitely the worst thing about being involved in very expressive tech companies that are following the science at the time. But maybe the technology was not ready in a sense. I think the big change that we have these days is that, like, in our climate zones, we're talking about Southeast Asia, we're talking about, you know, desert areas, we're not almost looking at free electricity. So yeah. we talk about what we would do, we probably talk about the DLTTS too, it's already a really bad question, you want to know more. How do you think this is running in the energy transition space? There has to be so much. It's a lot of things in certain climate regions and almost high level of growth. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, you know, right in our core focus in terms of, you know, it's all about energy supply, energy demand, and trying to match the two. And, you know, if you can utilize, for example, as you say, hydrogen, where you can, you know, utilize a huge amount of that excess capacity or that super cheap or potentially free energy, um, then, then by all means, there's some great business models to be made on the back of that. So energy, you know, particularly with solar, uh, should be cheap. The issue is that you need to be able to utilize it at the right time. Um, so, as I say, for our focus as a fund, it's all about the energy system transition. This transition is happening, and it's all about matching demand and supply. And there are a myriad of ways of doing that. And really, we're trying to focus on some of the companies that are capable of doing that, but also the enabling business models as a result of that. Um, and that's really what gets us excited, where you can, you know, start thinking about business models and flexible usage, which enables a huge uh, change in how energy is utilized. And that's what gets me excited. Uh, where is your image right now? Uh, Series A uh, is really the, 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 key part, the key point. I say we're really interested and in, more interested in where the company is today than what series it is. What we look for is the growth acceleration phase, where there's you know a product that is being sold, has been sold, has proved that it's been able to be sold. And then it's about making that into its the company pushing that from a product into a real growth phase um, of the company. So we're looking at companies that have some revenue but are looking to for growth acceleration in the next six to eighteen months. So we kind of don't care what series that is. We've invested in companies, you know, almost directly out of university, and we've invested in com companies that are ten years old out of a corporate. Um, but it's all about that growth acceleration phase. Um, and in terms of, you know, the amount of capital, uh, you know, we look at initial, um, our initial ticket size between one and five million. That's really our, uh, our sweet spot. Um, we've got a hundred million funds, so we're very capable of following on after that. You know, um, allocation per portfolio company on average will probably be around eight or nine million. Um, and, you know, or as a total, uh, we can do up to 15 million in, in an individual company, but we would we would never do that in a single round. <laughs> sure. So we'll always be a lead or a co-lead investor. Um, we're often. If we're not the direct lead in a deal, we're often brought in because of our energy area expertise um, and our network. We have, um, as you say, we've been in this game for a while, so we have a pretty extensive network, um, but also a lot of expertise in particular areas. You know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs like that because, in effect, when they do their pitches, you basically bin the first 10 slides and let's get to the meaty stuff in the middle. Um, but that's also true in terms of you know, how we want to work with portfolio companies after that. So we, we always take a board seat. Um, so it's all about, you know, we're not going to tell, we're never going to sit on the on the seat of management. That's not our role. You know, it's the management team's role to, to really do that. But we will help in any way possible in terms of getting that company to grow. And there's definitely some pitfalls, both in the energy industry and in high growth uh, companies, um, that it's very easy to fall into if you don't have uh, some experience here already.
For clean tech, I mean, for me, it's about flexible demand uh, with cheap electricity. Um, that's really, for me, the, the most interesting part. As you say, uh, as you've already mentioned, you know, LNG is getting so cheap and in large parts of the world is, is negative um, for significant periods of time now. And it's really the connection between almost all the way down to the individual consumer to the real energy markets. Um, connecting those two things together, you know, in a truly flexible manner means that you can get electricity really cheaply um, as a consumer and you can start utilizing that in, the, in new and interesting ways. So that's what really gets me excited. Um, and that also includes on the back of that, you know, the getting it into more into transportation as well. Um, the whole electrification or uh, for, for your interest as well, for hydrogen as well. Um, that's, that's what gets me interested and gets me excited. It's that combination, that connection, which is, uh, which I think now is, now is the time. And uh, with low cost of power, I mean, you, so many things are going to be capable uh, of being done that were never possible in the past. Sure. I mean, the best thing to do is to connect to to one of us in, in the team. Um, Julia and my Julia Padberg and uh, myself are the investment managers, so we're often the first point of contact. Um, also, just sending something to info at Set Ventures that goes to three different people in the team, so uh, straight away uh, we can get something. Um, you know, we are you know openly uh, uh, publicize what events and uh, alike we are uh, involved with all the time, so meeting us or sending us a, a message or, or in that regard um, and just ping us an email. Blind is, is fine um, as well as just uh, an introduction. Blind is in, you know, you need to explain who you are, uh, but uh, you don't need to uh, have uh, made a connection with us in the past. And he's going to be with us on the show next Tuesday for a pitch mastermind, supporting you as an entrepreneur how to present better, how to stop wasting your money and your time, and finally get funded for your idea and your growth. So, uh, Set Ventures 100 million fund out of Amsterdam. And uh, one of these funds, like ETF Ventures yesterday, one of the few ones that are still around there. We got a lot of new funds, but these guys have been building their portfolio and experience for the last 10, 15 years and have been incredibly successful at it over this time. So very, very exciting about the next program next Tuesday. And again, the subject came up, we talked about this earlier, was green hydrogen, right? The time has come. We think so, maybe. Definitely the hype is back. So um, it's going to be super exciting to see what's going to go on there. Uh, we just discussed where we had this rebroadcast about uh, what's going to happen to the deserts of the world. Because now we have, uh, I said, you know, AI pollinating robots. We got, you know very, very water efficient uh, systems that can grow in the desert. And um, this is a great transition to my friend Daniel who's gonna join us on the program because he just told me that he was born in Israel. Uh, Daniel, come up with us. And that's what your father did. So welcome to the program. Uh, please take your microphone over here. Uh, for you know our regular viewers, you know that we are fascinated in big teen clean technology but also we love the idea of global entrepreneurs living from incredible places like here in Bali and creating that niche business from here, living a great life and being very successful at it. And that's why I really want to talk to you. Welcome to the program, Daniel. Thanks for having me. So where are you from? Israel born. You just I, was, me. I was born in Israel, but I grew up in uh, Germany. And um, yeah, like... Uh, during university, I studied uh, Japanese, went abroad for a couple of years uh, to Japan. And uh, at that time, I experienced this international lifestyle. And then after going back to Germany, working in Germany for a couple of years, I thought I have to continue this interesting lifestyle. And that brought me to Thailand for a couple of years. And 
this year to Bali. And you do something um, would we call micro niching, really, right? In, in the industry, is uh, he is not building a big tech company that's probably going to be worth a billion dollars, but you generates a really good lifestyle for you. Tell us what you do. So what I'm doing is I teach uh, Microsoft Excel, the uh, software, to uh, German-speaking people. So it's uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. And uh, yeah, like uh, there are around, around uh, 750 million Excel users around the world. So a lot of people are working with Excel. And my big mission is to help people save time while working with Excel, especially um, being more efficient and automating uh, like mind-numbing tasks so people can focus on higher value tasks and don't have to uh, move data and information from one part to another all day long. Um, very, very needed. Um, you know, we hired a lot of people in Germany over the years. Felix is smiling there in the back um, because we literally have hired people in the past that thought Excel is just there for making lines. Like it's just a line creation program. It's a lot more than that, right? Yeah, like um, yeah, many professions, um, especially controlling or accounting, people work with Excel all their working career. So they spend tens of thousands of hours with Excel. And uh, yeah, I try to give them uh, a lot of uh, tips and tricks and also not only the simple stuff, but also up to VBA programming so they can automate processes. And yeah, that um, that's can be a very powerful tool. And a little bit more to my backstory, I was uh, working in a market research company in Germany for five years. And it was a very data heavy um, yeah, business. And we managed to double the revenue in three years by and basically also doubling the amount of project work we could handle because we automated a lot of processes in, in Excel. So moving data from the spreadsheets to a database and back from the database to reports, basically. And uh, that showed me how much, uh, what kind of impact Excel can have on a organization. And I decided to share this knowledge, not, uh, not only internally with the company, but um, to go out in the market and uh, help co other companies as a freelancer at first. And then a year later, I discovered uh, this whole topic of e-learning online courses. And now I'm sharing my knowledge with my students. And uh, just a personal question first. So you're from Germany, right? You just told me your father is an engineer. So uh, how did your family and your surrounding react to your decision to live on the beach in Thailand and make a living in, in such a non-traditional way? Let's put it mildly. So I think like um, my father, he's uh, from Israel and he basically is now living in uh, Germany. So he's used to live abroad and to travel. And they met when my mother was tra traveling to Israel and living in Israel. So both of them had this experience of living abroad. Uh, so I got a lot of support from them. And uh, also during my university time, I uh, maxed out all the exchange programs to stay as much time as possible in Japan back then. So, yeah, maybe some people got, uh, could uh, see it coming. And in general, my friends are happy for me and uh, sometimes a little bit jealous, and, but they also come and visit me. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think every time when I talk, for example, to clients and uh, I, I tell them on the phone that I'm calling from Bali or from Thailand, they are very uh, curious and interested and a little bit envious sometimes as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I do believe, and we keep bringing this up, I, I do believe that we're trendsetters in a certain way, as uh, you see right now during COVID, and this has accelerated the whole thing, that obviously companies are able to manage without having expensive office buildings and keeping people trapped in, in very expensive neighborhoods with you know people they don't know, they don't care about. So um, how, does your, I mean, how does your life look like as a digital entrepreneur? That's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, for me, like it was a lot of work in the first couple of years to build up the course, which is um, quite huge nowadays. Like um, it's about sixty hours of content, six hundred videos. So it took a couple of years to create the whole thing, and now it's more like um, managing the system. It's um, most of my time I spend on uh, answering student questions not so much on marketing or b creating new material because it's already so overwhelmingly, mm -hmm. uh, so overwhelming. And uh, yeah, so um, my focus is shifts more to like a more social life and um, 
networking with interesting people and um, focusing on other um, topics or other things in life. You know. So what's the important thing about this to understand um, if you're having an office job out there? And I'm not saying that this is for everybody, right? I think you no, need to have wrong. a certain mindset. No, yeah. We see a lot of people that get totally lost without the structure of having an office job. But uh, you have created a model now because all your courses are online, right? This is for yes. people mm. that are not in the middle of this important to understand. And this course now are online and giving you revenue on a monthly basis, probably sometimes more than others. But generally, because you have so many of them, something's always selling. Yeah, um, so it's basically um, uh, multiple courses bundled into one big course. And um, the interesting thing was, uh, especially this year with COVID, um, my competitors who or the most companies buy traditionally Excel training as in-person training. But uh, through, uh, because of COVID, this got all canceled and everyone moved online. And companies uh, became much more comfortable to, um, yeah, to try out a different uh, modality of uh, training. So uh, for me, it was, um, yeah, business-wise, it was a blessing because everyone moved online. People were stuck at home and had much more free time um, because of some Kurzarbeit scheme where like uh, working hours got reduced. So people have uh, more time and they uh, are much more open to learn online and use online courses as a means to get some knowledge transfer into the companies. Yeah. So um, I don't know about you, I, I, don't, I, mean, I just see you in the office here, like we, we all work from the same co-working space. Also misunderstanding, working from home as digital nomad doesn't necessarily mean you're working from home and you're by yourself. Um, I think, honestly, that we're having many more meaningful conversations in a co-working space like Tropical Nomad than you would have in a corporate environment where you're forced you know, to talk to people that are working kind of the same thing. Like we meet people from all different walks of life. It really changes so much. Um, how do you see the difference between working in a corporate job in Germany or like an office job like you had before or you know, for a state employment over your lifestyle right now? What are, what are the benefits and the drawbacks? Um, so I would say um, a big benefit is, of course, that you have uh, freedom. You can um, structure your day as you want. But that comes also with the challenge that you have to be disciplined. And um, that is also a reason why this kind of lifestyle is not for everyone. Uh, some people thrive in like a more uh, traditional system where you have, um, yeah, where you have more control, outside control. So this is a big challenge, but uh, can also be, um, yeah, um, yeah, opportunity to, and uh, also. Um, Another big thing is uh, that you can really decide what you want to work on and uh, with whom you want to work on these uh, challenges. And these are yeah, some upsides and of course you can um, be wherever you want. And for me personally, I was born in Israel but grew up in Germany. I always wanted to get away from the cold weather. So that was one big reason. And the another big reason was to get to know interesting people from who are doing different things. It's very inspiring. To meet these kind of people. Uh, I, I think so as well. And uh, for the people that just saw the video of our opening from Census last week, you were there partying hard. See, the life, is, life is really tough here. I'm, I'm sorry to rub it in. It's COVID time. I know a lot of you people are locked up at home, but uh, uh, we don't have that much COVID here. We still get to have some fun. Um, one other question about the cost. I mean, for me, the biggest difference coming to a place like Bali is that we kind of live a millionaire lifestyle here that makes our friends at home always like, how do you do it? But for me... To, after Los Angeles, I mean, I'm, I'm reduced my cost by 95, 96%. Um, for what we pay here for a villa, you wouldn't get a VG Zimmer in, in Munich at this point. How do you see that difference? You have to make less money, right? Um, that is, um, that's why I always recommend going to, let's say, Thailand or here, maybe if you want to start something new, because you have a much bigger, longer run rate. And also, it's uh, for me, it's not only about the cost, because um, some things you can't buy, like uh, good weather or happy people, you, this kind of environment, you can't buy with uh, any kind of money back in uh, some other places. And uh, for me, like one big value for me is this kind of uh, efficiency, like um, outsourcing things. And uh, I actually wrote my, my thesis about like business process outsourcing. 
And I try to lift that by being in these kind of environments because you can outsource so much. You know, for example, if you don't want to cook, you can always go out to eat. Um, you don't have to clean your room, there's housekeeping. You don't have to do the laundry, there's uh, another service doing that. And um, you can really focus on your work and what uh, brings uh, joy to your life. And you don't have to deal with anything else. And uh, also finding, for example, an apartment takes uh, half an hour if you, if you just pick something. In Germany, you have to line up and uh, pray that you get an apartment, for example. It's, uh, so being here in Asia is very convenient. And uh, the cost is uh, much lower, yeah. I mean, this is actually something I, I probably I don't talk enough about on our program when it comes to the benefits of being a, a digital nomad. I get often the question, I mean, we produce, I don't know, four hours of content per week. We run four government projects at the same time. Uh, we have, you know, meditation every day. We have training every day. We have so many things going on. We're still able to go out all the time. Um, and it looks, at least on Instagram, like we're, we're living three or four lives at the same time. And so I often get that question, how do you guys actually do that? How much energy do you have? But you brought up a, game, a great point. This would all not be possible if you'd be wasting our time on useless tasks that I hate. Like I hate going to the grocery store. Like it drives me bonkers. I don't want to do that. I hate driving a car. I don't like to go to the gas station. Um, you know, I don't like to clean. I mean, to be honest, I don't like to make my bed. I'm the biggest messy out there. I leave everything behind me. But um, I don't even like to go to the gym. So the difference here is that it would be absolutely impossible in Germany, for example, you got the personal trainer, right? You got the person that can kind of cook for you, you got the person that cleans for you, you got the person that does your, your laundry, whatever you need to do. So you can really focus on the two things, and I really thank you for the summing it up, on the two things that are important to you, making a good living, right? So you can focus on whatever is driving you on your vision, and you can focus on the things that make you feel better as a person and make you feel happy. Uh, inside and, and both of the things I feel in Germany often taken up by useless tasks somebody could do for you. Yeah, like in, in Germany, it's not only, let's say, the working time, but you have to also recover from work and commute. Also commute. And then you have to buy the groceries and take care of your house and your possessions. That's also a thing um, which a lot of uh, digital nomads do. It, they live kind of like a minimalistic. So you don't have many things you have to take care of, you know. So you don't have to uh, like uh, repair your car or go to a gas station or like all these little things, and they add up so much. So the actual free time, uh, where you also have energy, uh, is very limited in Germany, and that's also um, why many, for example, many of my friends they sometimes think about starting something, but they are so drained. After work, it's not only the time, but the energy is not there to really start something new. Yeah, to, and to do something. And, and also a big thing about doing something for yourself, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you are, but uh, I see a lot of people, especially my generation, that they don't, after they've taken care of the kids and everything else, they don't have the energy to take, do anything for themselves. And because we kind of get rid of, I mean, we have two nannies at home, right, which costs us less than the kita in Germany. But uh, because of this, you know, you can have a healthy relationship. You can actually have time with your partner to go out for a date every day if you want to. But none of this would be possible if you would have to pay labor costs like we did in L.A. This would be absolutely impossible. Yeah, that's uh, what, uh, what I also saw in uh, many countries. For example, I was half a year in uh, Medellin, Colombia. And uh, back then I was um, dating a girl and she um, was from like a, I would say lower middle class uh, family, but they still had a maid there uh, helping with the household and everything. And uh, my, my friends back home in Germany who earn much, much more, and they can't really afford uh, someone because of the minimum wage and everything. So it's, even though people earn much more, the, like the, this kind of services you can buy and the lifestyle and the life quality is not that high. It's, it's I mean, I, I think you're really, um the future will be, and I'm just asking you from the bottom of my heart, please don't all come to Bali. Um, like, we're really kind of selective of who we like to have here. we got an incredible community, and I'm not necessarily saying just because you're watching this program that you're invited. Um, but <laughs> it has so many benefits to it, and, and I s sometimes see this utter disbelief, like, you know, people that I know for a long time and family and everything, they're like, how do you guys live? It looks like, you know, you live like kind of this fake life. I said, it's very different. We actually live a real life and we are wasting a lot less time 
on stupid shit that people like waste their time at home and we can use that time to build new businesses, live a better life, be healthier, you know, go to the gym, go get a trainer. Um, I think we have a massive benefit. Yeah, and, uh, and then on the other side, it becomes also a challenge what to do with all the time. I think uh, you have uh, like a lot of interests and uh, a lot of different things you do. But uh, You can always color your hair. Yeah, if you're like really man, running out of yeah, things to do, color yeah. your hair. <laughs> There's always another color. It keeps people busy talking for a month. It uh, definitely takes some adjustment, you know, like uh, when you when you really automated everything, um, to what what to fill up uh, your whole yeah. day with, you know. Like before, you would always uh, yeah be in the job and you have so many little tasks to do, and now you have so much free time. Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends really on your business model, but uh, for me, I set up my business so it runs more or less automatically. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, and, that, and that's that's doesn't everybody want this? I mean, doesn't everybody like want to be on the beach and have an automatic business? I know you have been investing and working hard for the last few three years to get everything online, but it also makes it now tough for anybody else. If I'm a German speaker and I would teach Excel, why why would I want to do it? Because you pretty much have asked all the questions already. That problem, we always say for entrepreneurs, you know, you set out there to solve a problem. You're definitely solving a problem. Most people I met in my life, even financial analysts barely know how to use Excel, to be quite honest, right? There, it's, it's Everybody writes it on their resume, but Excel has so many functions and everything, you can spend your life doing nothing else. Uh, most people know very little about it, or, you know, then comes the next upgrade, and they might even have more functions than before. How do you see your business growing from here? Are you going to focus down on other software products in the future, or are you just very happy of being the Excel hero that you are? Yeah, right now I'm um, happy to be positioned as an Excel hero, and um, there's also demand for like uh, net next level things like Power BI, which is more like a business intelligence dashboard solution. But uh, there I partnered up with another person, and I'm offering also his expertise on my website, for example. Um, which is, but the more complicated, the more niche you go, uh, the less audience uh, you have. Um, and with Excel, it's a mass market because in every company, there are new employees starting. They need Excel training. And uh, I think there's uh, still a lot of uh, potential there to, um, to harness. And uh, uh, my, my lifetime goal is to reach 500,000 people. So far, I reached 40,000 people with my courses. And uh, yeah, by my, that's, that's my contribution, I see. And uh, I want to give to, to the world a little bit just to help people to to free up this time and energy and so it can be directed to other nice uh, adventures or ideas or, or more meaningful work with like clean tech for example yeah. no? now, even though some people really like working on excel i've met those people as well it's kind of like their hobby it's like their passion to to make it look good um, but uh, it for me just needs to be done and honestly if you're doing a big finance project it just needs to be accurate to be quite honest that's the most important thing because um, it's, it's very tough from the outside to see if actually your results are plausible um, but never try to take away I, I've actually brought that question up Oliver you might remember that um, during one of our last funding rounds uh, with our head of investment at back point I said how is it possible on a 20 million dollar deal we're still using Excel but there was no way. It's like that. that that's, we will always do this, right? Yeah, until Power BI and a few other programs and AI decides to take over and, and do it all for us. Um, but very much Excel is the bread and butter, the livelihood of every finance person uh, for their entire life. Um, and that's what it is. And that's what it's going to be for the next five years, for sure. And it, it, it keeps everybody in that industry and in, in, in business. I know Oliver loves to play with Excel in his free time. Um, you know, nothing better to do. Maybe now soon, but now. Um, it's all good. We try to be creative at the same time. Uh, Daniel, what's the best way to reach you if I want to learn more about Excel? How can I get involved? Should I go to Udemy? Should I go to your website? How can I find your classes? Uh, so best would be um, under excelhero.de, excelhero.de. That's uh, my main website where I have all my content. And yeah, and there you find my contact details. Also, if you uh, look on YouTube, you'll find me there as well under Excel Hero or just type in any Excel function name and then it should be the first result or the second. So I'm, I'm battling uh, it out with Microsoft. <laughs> uh, just via ads or you just have been doing this for so long? I know, uh, like, uh, so um, 
like uh, this is my my a little bit my business secret, but uh, I mean like uh, it's not all enough to just write the content, but you also have to do the SEO, the search yeah. engine optimization. And they are partnering with with someone who is very uh, proficient in that. And so for most uh, like for example function Excel uh, Excel function names, my website will be ranked on one place one or two, sometimes over Microsoft. So. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And we can definitely learn from this. Um, you know, so we're going to do this offline, though. Danny, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, Super interesting. Um, and again, another you know, example of all these creative business cases that we have in, in Bali. Right? It's a really awesome community here. So I hope you're going to stay with us uh, on the island even after COVID is over for a little bit. Of course, of course. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Thanks uh, we for have one, one uh, actual viewer question. Okay. Uh, how do you expect to grow uh, your business in the future and what is your vision for the future? Um, so right now I'm like trying to like increase uh, even more the traffic to my website and also I think uh, the whole e-learning industry is growing and um, it's, it's sometimes amazing that it's not that widespread still. And also the big companies, um, normally they just spend a fraction of their uh, learning budget on online solutions. And I think I will grow with the market and um, with the d existing platform. So there will be much more um, yeah, uh, growth potential there in the future, I think. Yeah. And in general, creating more content, uh, investing more time and money into uh, advertisement, marketing, and so on. I think that will be uh, my, my uh, yeah, way forward. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so much. And Oliver, so, um, or should we bring Itchy back on? <laughs> I'd quite like to, a little bit of, we've missed out the news snippet aspect. Of oh, yes. Tonight. What's and going on um, in the news? Uh, well, I think going from, going from micro Excel numbers to, to macro yeah. and where we work, what we want to do, uh, sustainability, and um, the IDFC, the Inde International Development Finance Club, which is 26 national development banks, um, have put uh, money where their mouth is over the last few years. And since 2015 Paris Accord, um, they've invested 867 billion USD um, into green and sustainable finance positions. So uh, any startup entrepreneur that thinks the money isn't out there, it's, it's actually there. And uh, in 2019, they actually pledged and invested 197 billion, um, which is up 40% on 2018. We're nowhere near... Uh, the 2017 records, but it's it's there and a lot of people are focusing on it. So it's taking from micro and macro levels, uh, it's exciting. And uh, moving on from the finance aspect, we're expecting a lovely vocal live guest to come on and fin finish the show. Um, maybe running a few minutes late, but uh, looking forward to it. Fantastic. Yeah, there definitely is... Uh the environment is really changing, and we had Remy de Tonac on a program yesterday of ETF partners, and um, one of the you know most you know prominent uh, venture capital funds in Europe and clean technology, and you could just tell how excited uh, Remy was, and so are we about you know having a new U.S. president, because obviously, you know. You might think the U.S. are done and kind of laughable after four years of Trump, or whatever your personal opinion is. That might have been mine. Um, but it's still the largest capital market in the world. And the challenges we're facing these days with climate change and everything else is going to be very, very tough to solve without access to, yes, capital markets. And to now have a president-elect that actually supports this and having the Democrats back in charge and having the ear of, um, you know, like... People I met personally, like Kamala Harris, for example, um, the, the new California governor, for example, these are people very, very dedicated to solving climate change issues, getting involved, investing money. So now we have kind of this strong force from California in the White House accessing this massive amounts of capital, hopefully putting the regulations and incentives in place to reduce carbon emissions from the United States to go you know, fully renewables in the next 20 years, maybe go fully electric on their transportation. There's so much that can be done if the U.S. gets behind this. Because right now, China is the biggest player in renewables in the world. 
um, you know, they're kind of dwarfing everybody else. But if the U.S. gets back in the game and we kind of could have this like international competition of who is outspending each other and making a bigger difference to their carbon emissions, it could be the best thing that can happen. And uh, so we're super excited about what's going to be going on in U.S. policy in the coming months. And um, so it's just for us in the clean tech industry, it has been an incredibly happy week. Now we just need to get Trump out of the White House, uh, just carry him out if need be. But we just cannot have another four years of this. So super happy about it. And I think, Oliver, getting back to your point, this is just going to be the beginning of the money that is pouring into exactly. clean technology. And we might actually want to do some programs from the U.S. in the future. I would be looking forward to going home at least for brief periods of time even though Bali still rocks. And uh, I don't know how far you on that, but we have a special guest coming on tonight. He's slowly getting ready. Um, you saw his attractive face on our beautiful video from Census last week. Felix did a great job of making him look good. I mean, you look freaking like a rock star out there that you are. I don't know what I, you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you totally deserve that coverage. Let me just uh, get your mic up here. Um, Let's talk a little bit, Pete, though, because we just met at, um, and this is Bali again, we met at a class that focuses on selling online courses, right? And we were randomly talking, and somebody said, listen, man, that, that guy is like an amazing musician, and, and it was 8.45 in the morning, reading all my time of the day. Um, but this is where you meet. Like, you know, we were just at a conference, and like people were sharing their knowledge about how to, you know, create million-dollar classes. First of all, welcome to the program. And why are you interested in online classes? Um, that's a good question. Um, I've actually, I've always kind of been into sales and marketing. I studied psychology and economics. And if I wasn't playing music, I'd probably be in that sphere or would have been in that sphere from the beginning. And um, I've been a professional musician for seven years, traveling around the world and running my own booking agency and kind of in the business of music. And I suppose with everything shutting down and there being no concerts, I naturally just gravitated towards this movement, towards the online courses and, yeah, just the, the massive potential that's there for, uh, for growth and for you know, sharing of information and the new way of learning, you know, that's no longer the classroom and the, you know, the study hall. It's like you can, for a very cheap or free, you can actually learn a lot and practical skills as well, you know. And uh, tell us something about your background. I, I know you're from Ireland. I think I misquoted that last week. I'm a very, very, no, you know, no, it's, it's a very sensitive subject. Uh, so tell us something where you come, come from and how you ended up in Bali. Um, so yeah, I come from Dublin in Ireland. Um, I haven't lived there for about seven years. Um, I've been living around the world, uh, mostly in the Greek islands um, in the summer and Austria in a ski resort in the winter. And then That's just terrible. It's awful. Terrible, it's I terrible. know. But somebody has to do it. Somebody. That's exactly right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, just kind of hopping around and, you know, going between, I suppose, the seasons and just, you know, enjoying my 20s, you could say, you know. And, um, still in your 20s? I'm 29, yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> freaking old. Ouch, that hurts. Ah, it's all good. I, uh, I definitely, I feel like the, the travels have definitely wisened me up a bit, yeah. you know. But, you um, started doing this when you are 22. You just moved to the, to the Greek Isles? I finished university and everyone's like, when are you going to get a real job? I said, I'm going to do music for a year and see what happens. And uh, six months later, I was living in Paris, playing full time, all expenses paid around Paris. So that was kind of, there was no going back. Back to a nine to five after that one. I spent my, my teenage years. It was kind of awesome. Um, but <laughs> I, I moved to. I did a mistake though. You moved to the Greek Isles and other places where it's kind of a little bit cheaper to live. Generally, I moved to New York City. Okay. Uh, so for me, it was a life changing experience because uh, I love being a musician, right? And I love to yeah, perform. Yeah. The set we performed last week together. You did. It was the, the the most fun I've had with my pants on in a very <laughs> very long time. <laughs> it really was a very very intense like. Bah, it was a great experience. Um, what kind of killed it for me later on living in New York City was this feeling of, of, of the total opposite of Bali. I needed to make a lot of money in order to have a very low quality of life. Well, now yeah. we need to you know, need a little money to have an amazing quality of life. Absolutely. So what brought you to Bali? Um, I'd always kind of been drawn to here naturally. I actually, funny story, I met, uh, I used to work in a, in a Thai restaurant in Dublin 10 years ago when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And my manager was a Balinese guy. And he said, you should come to Bali. And I said, what the hell is Bali? Like Pre-Instagram, pre like all of that. And uh, then I went to Greece and I met all these Australians and they're like, oh, Bali, Bali, Bali. And I'm like, all right, let's go check this out. So I came and it was like that mix of the island life 
with that potential for actually like living on an island where you can't even like buy I don't know a pair of shoes or something. You just yeah. kind of get it all from the mainland. So that mix of like you could have a normal life and have a business while also you know living that kind of really just laid back an island vibe. You know, so that was what brought me. Is, is, is there anything here you, you you can think of that we can't buy or the Lego infrastructure doesn't you know? I mean, now we even have great cheese here. That, you know, a little shout out to KM Zero. These guys make. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm vegan now, so I wouldn't know. But when I was still eating cheese, it was freaking amazing. Uh, we have everything here now, right? Absolutely. It's uh, we're a bit spoiled, yeah. particularly in the last few months. You know, I really, uh, I never actually planned to spend as much time here. Like I was supposed to leave in May to go to Europe, and um, yeah, it's been a blessing. So you know. it's been an amazing time, right? Yeah. I mean, again, don't listen to this. We're not bragging, but no. the last few months is like. <laughs> It's going to go down history as a very, very special time in Bali because, you know, we usually have, I don't know, 8.5 million tourists here per year. Yeah. Now we have like 5,000 locals from Jakarta that come visit. Yeah, um, absolutely. So it's just us. Pretty much. So all this incredible people you see in our program, is just us here hanging out on the beach, drinking beer, making music, making love, tough life, but somebody has to do it. Exactly. Um, yeah. So tell us a little something before we're going to start uh, and, and making you work a little bit. <laughs> Um, you're kind of pivoting a little bit, though. I mean, you say you're not just a musician. You're also doing what uh, Daniel is doing, uh, building your own online business. Sure, yeah. So I'm working like now as a um, kind of like a consultant or like a project manager for courses. So helping, like taking, let's say, experts in their field and who already have been maybe like an established following and helping who just don't know, understand how to take, how to deliver value to their customers, basically. So taking them, taking their audience, and just helping them like pull that creativity out of them into a product that can then, and building the funnels and the email marketing and stuff around that to deliver that product. So yeah, it's been, it's been a real learning curve. Like I said, I've just been I've, like working with four or five different clients and just like in the deep end with it. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I really, I really, really enjoy it. Like as a, as a, as a second career, and my goal would be, I think, and I see in coaching and I see in online courses, I see like, a lot of potential for earning and I see in the music industry which I love just not a lot of business potential at all like everything's free on Spotify even the gigs aren't on anymore they'll, they'll be severely restricted I think for at least another year so I see a lot of potential to have a lot of success in the online course industry and even potentially some music courses yeah. and stuff as well and um, to then use that capital to invest into the music to get the best producers to get the you know, the, the right uh, distribution and everything for music. So then it's no longer this like uphill struggle where you're trying to play in front of five people to get noticed. It's like you can actually like go straight to the top and cut out that middleman, cut out the labels and everything. Yeah. So it, 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 the, the music industry has just simply changed so much. It was always tough, but uh, tough to make a living now. And um, I mean, as bizarre as this is to, to a lot of my, my musician friends from back there, so, you know, how can is that that you stop performing? It's, it's not that I, I stopped performing for years, right? But you know me a little bit. I, I perform publicly three to four times per week, <laughs> right? I, I get more performances in than most professionals. We're going to go to movies later, right? Okay. Yeah, all right. I didn't know shoes. You, 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 don't need, you don't need <laughs> shoes for that. It's, it's, it's a barefoot uh, invite only place. Um, so, but, you know, you can combine the two things. And that brings us back to the discussion with Daniel. If you have your life automated and you actually start generating profits online from your business and, and the, the value you bring to other people and then you live in an environment where you can automate all those stupid things like you know making your bed and cleaning all these other things you have actually more time at the end of it to sing than when i was a professional singer yeah and there you come to digital nomad light life so what did you um prepare for us today uh it's an excellent question i kind of said we just go with the flow and see what happens so i haven't prepared anything but uh i was going to ask you what your favorite artist is and i was going to play one by them ah uh, this, this <laughs> is a very 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 tough question um, I, I love what you did last week. I mean, your, your performance was so passionate and so rock star. And, and just one quick question because, you know, musicians all react very differently. So when we did Census last week, it was a kind of a madhouse, right? It was a madhouse, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it, great. Was, it was organized chaos. Yeah. And, and we have a big cultural difference between our Indonesian friends, like who were headlining the evening because we're in Indonesia, and, and they were like stressing out. They're like, this is, yeah. this is panicky. You strived on that energy. I mean, you were oh, yeah. all out there, right? It was crazy. So uh, what kind of drives you? Like, what do you love to go out and, and sing? And, and, and what do you feel the most passionate about? Um, if I was to choose a style, um, 
it would be like really upbeat, energetic funk and disco and like the, the, the Motown classics and just anything that has soul and character, which I feel like in general is pretty lacking. That really, those are universal songs that people can just get up and dance to. You know yeah. what I mean? Those ones are just, for me, like, yeah, to be able to deliver that and just to feel a crowd and to yeah. see where they're at. And just like even last week when I played like an original song to start, I was like, let's give this one a go, you know? And it was like, and people loved it. It was like, great. Like, that's the energy. People yeah. are open to seeing yeah. that. They're not play Wonderwall or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like they want to hear original yeah, music. It was the energy. I mean, yeah. you kind of, the energy you portrayed out there and it led them kind of right into the disco phase and people were, I mean, I, I got the, the, the enjoyment, the excitement of the crowd last week really was uh, something I haven't felt at least in a long time. I don't know how I feel about it, but... Oui. Yeah. Let's, let's do that again. Yeah. I think it might be on the horizon, maybe coming up soon, maybe on the 19th, 7 o'clock. Okay, cool. Um, but it's invitation only, so you have to go to Instagram. Maybe see what... It's going to be Ichi Mania 2020 Part 2, <laughs> past the point of no return. Let's do this again better than ever, mm -hmm. is the project title. Um, <laughs> I am very good at making very, yeah, very yeah, stupid absolutely. titles. Pete, take it from here. So what are you going to sing for us? Um, let's do an original first, and I'll do a little little cover version after. How does that sound? That sounds amazing. One yeah. quick shout out. Um, my wife at home, we're going to go to Wobies later, so please get ready <laughs> if you're still watching this thing. So you can't complain. I didn't tell you later. Just, uh, this is going to be a test if you're actually watching. Thanks, Pete. Yes. Take it from here. Um, yeah, let's, go for, let's go for this one. So this is a uh, this is a song called Why Do We, and I just actually played at a breathwork circle, which was a very different, chill like meditation, you know. And I played the same song but a lot slower. Why do we? Why do we? Sometimes in life. You feel your feelings start to rise And they are such a necessary part of human life But we're told it's not safe to let them out and show So we hold them down And never let your feelings come out Why can this be? Survival mechanism, see, but it's not me to ever let some emotions get me down. And so it's time to laugh and run and sing and dance and cry and let love out. And never let your feelings get you down. Why do we try? Why do we try to push them down? Why do we try? Why do we try to push them down? Why do we try? Why do we try to push them down? Let your feelings just come out The birds they sing But they don't care about a thing And dogs they play in whichever kind of way And bees they roam To whichever flower home And still we're so Wrapped up in our feelings Get us down So, so down Well, it's time that we let the good look inside And bed of where the problem lies And get off your seven sound And you'll find that that's profound And Take off your TV screen and your mobile phone And everything that you dream of will start to come And then your life will fill with love and warmth again Why do we try? Why do we try to push them down? Why do we try? Why do we try to push them down? Why do we try? Why do we try to push them down? Your feelings just come out. Let your feelings just come out. Just let your feelings all come out.
Thank you. I, I can see that it really worked for a breathworking workshop yes. as well. Very it worked on so many, <laughs> so many. It was, it was so slower than Why do we? You know, like, I, know, I, know uh, I love that. Yeah. You can turn that into a mantra. Yeah, let's do if, it. If, you know, <laughs> it, it's, uh, are you a very spiritual person, very esoteric? or? It's Bali. I mean, bre breath working <laughs> is not very esoteric. It's actually just about breathing. But it's, it's more scientific esoteric. You yeah. know? It's the kind of the woo-woo meets the, uh, you know, the clinical. Yeah. But, um, no, I d I like, I've done a little bit in India. Like I did a sound healing course last year for yeah. two weeks. And uh, I've done a bit of Reiki and I've done a bit of, a little bit of everything, you know. So I'm kind of like, you know, closet woo, you could say. Uh, yeah, okay. Behind the scenes. Yeah. But uh, try, I, like the, I like the two. I like the out in the, the nightlife, the music, and then being able to bring that in in a more healing setting as well. No, we got a big heart, right? I think that's one. And then they love music, uh, the, the woo-woos, right? They always play some music along and they really get very yeah, deep yeah, into yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, great. It's, it's, it's a different world it's if you haven't tried crowd. it out. It's, it's, uh, They're not throwing beers at you, that's for sure. I exactly. <laughs> um, now we're going to have so much fun. So we got one more song and then it's going to be the end of our program, actually, for tonight. We're going to close with you. And okay. what better way to close? We have no DJ this time. Okay. Uh, they shouted last time uh, DJ David Herrera was freaking awesome. Okay. But, you know, so I have big, boot, big boots to fill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you got for us? Um, let's do some Motown. Let's do, I'm feeling like some, I think was it Aretha that sung it? Nah, let's do a bit, just something a bit upbeat. I'm sure there's a few people out there who want, feeling like a bit of a boogie coming Yes, up, so. let's do this. Fantastic. <laughs> this is probably one of my favorite songs to play live. Either it was a preacher's son when the daddy would visit cop along. When the gather out start to walk in, there's a Billy and me go walk in. Back to the backyard, so we go walk in. Then he looked into my eyes. Lord knows to my surprise, the only boy that could ever teach me was a sign preacher man. And the only boy that could ever preach me was a sign preacher man. Yes, he was. He was. Oh, yes, he was. And being good isn't always easy. No matter how hard to try. When I started sweet talking to me, come and tell me everything is alright. You kiss and tell me everything is alright. So can I get away again tonight? The only boy that can ever teach me was the son of a preacher man. And the only boy that could ever reach me was the son of a preacher man. Yes, he was. He was. Oh, yes, he was. And how well I remember the look that was in his eyes Seeing a kiss from me on the side Taking time to make time Till I mean it is all mine Learning from me, shot there's no end Looking to see how much we've grown And the only boy that could ever preach me Was the son of a preacher man And the only boy that could ever teach me Was the son of a preacher man And the only boy that could ever reach me was a sad preacher man And the only boy that could ever teach me Was a sad preacher man so he was, he was Oh, yeah, 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 yes, he was yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much We'll have to get you in for a duet next time. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. I've actually, I'm the only person that's not sung on this program yet. Okay. That's, that's, it's going to come one day. It's, it's <laughs> going to come. So we're going to Bowie's next. Um, I'm just very, very happy to show that I have the coolest friends on the islands. So <laughs> it's a very, very selfish task. Let's do this next. Uh, Pete, thank you so much for the input. And uh, it's Pete Burns. Pete it's, Bur it's Pete Burns. It's Pete Burns. On Instagram. Instagram, yes. All right. Best way to find him. So one of the most amazing artists I've ever met. Incredible voice. If you hear it live, um, it's it's. I hope it's, it translates it's, well, it's, but it's, you know, it's really, really, really awesome. And again, there might be another census party coming up. Maybe you know, I've heard rumors. It's an underground thing <laughs> on the 19th of November, maybe around seven-ish. Um, it would be amazing. 
Thank you all so much um, for making this happen today. Thank you, Oliver, um, our back-end intelligence here and the person that actually spends his nights on the phone and online to get all of our incredible guests. Thank you, Felix, uh, for our technical part and making me look incredibly sexy on our census video. Actually, both of us, I think, have almost never looked better. It was a really, really, really amazing job on this thing. I need Thank that you. footage. Thank you, Itchy, for, for hosting us again. Tropical Nomad, best place in town. If you come to Bali to work, Tropical Nomad is the place to be. He also has a few amazing restaurants, uh, which he's not giving enough credit to. One Eye Jack, incredible J Japanese food. Alma Tapas, freaking go have the octopus if you're on the island. Daniel still with us here, the Excel hero from Germany. What a really, really cool story. And we're going to be back on Tuesday with um, Craig Douglas from Set Ventures, $100 million fund financing clean technology startups. The following week is going to be really awesome. I'm super excited. Gerta Vau is going to be joining us from Shell Ventures. And obviously, they have a little bit more to spend than that hundred million. Uh, you know, Craig kind of looks a little bit small in comparison. I don't know what the budget of Shell is these days, but it's going to be super exciting to see one of one of the largest oil companies in the world is doing in the field of renewables and how they're interested in investing into your company. So they're going to help you to make your pitch better, so you can get the investment that you need to grow your companies. And then, very very big thing. November 25th, the best of technology from Israel. We're going to have with our friends from Terra Ventures on the 25th of November presenting five super innovative uh, Israeli tech companies. We had one on last night. If you have missed it, check it out on YouTube. It is AI-backed robot micropollination. I mean, how cool. The, I mean, I'm, I'm still blown away. It's like robots driving around pollinating plants and greenhouses. How freaking cool is that? And then December 3rd, we're going to have EX Venture Night coming from USA and Canada in collaboration with World Trade Center in Los Angeles. And uh, we're going to have 15 of the best U.S., Canadian clean tech companies in our collaboration with Greentown Labs and Canadian Clean Tech Accelerator. And wow, it's going to be an amazing end of this year. And um, if you're in Bali, check out Census Changu on Instagram because I think we might be back for a second episode on that. I've heard rumors on the 19th. Thank you, everybody, so much. My name is Julian. I'm happy to be your host. We see you next Tuesday. Have a good night from beautiful Changu, Bali. Bye, everybody.